It's an incredible blessing this morning to be closing off our series, Our Formed Life, and how cool is it to actually see our potter out in the foyer as you walked in. The kids are just like, whoa, (laughs) they're into it. Um, But the whole purpose of that and what we've been doing is talking about what does it mean for us to take Scripture, see the formed life of Joseph and apply it to our life. And I hope over these 12 or so weeks that we've been doing this, that you've actually grabbed a hold and and, uh, taken the opportunity to wrestle with this part potent picture that God has done in Joseph's life, this astonishing hand of formation that he's put into Joseph's story, this molding and shaping over a lifetime that finds today its mountaintop moment in chapter 49 and 50. And uh, we've spent 12 weeks tracking this development of this character um, from arrogant, naive boy, okay, where we started way back in chapter 37. And now we're starting to see the dream of God come to its finale right here at the end. He's moving from a naive boy to an intelligent nation saving right hand to the world leader of that time. Incredible change and movement. And uh, I think it's something that for us, it's easy to pass over a series and not actually reflect back on those things that have gone past. This incredible journey of someone's life being transformed. But this week, I read this very inspirational quote. And it said this. It said, within three generations, you will be forgotten. In three generations, you will be forgotten. Isn't that inspiring? Well done, Rob. Way to start a sermon this morning. Really inspiring quote. You see, few, if any, people will remember your name or anything about you in just 40 to 50 years from now. It's a bit sombering, isn't it? A bit sobering, I should say. Now, there's this uplifting quote, but as I reflect back and I think about who were my great-grandparents? I asked that question of myself this week. Do you know what? I didn't know. Especially on my dad's side, I, I, I don't even know their names. In fact, I went searching and I, I actually uh, text some of my aunties and uncles and they didn't get back to me, which was really nice of them. Um, <coughs> I said something about my family. Uh, but, uh, you know, I didn't know the names of my great-grandparents on my dad's side. I know the great-grandparents on my mum's side because on Māori there's whakapapa and so we know we can trace these lines back generations I knew their names, but I didn't know anything about them. The letter that I shared a a few months back about my great nana, you know, that was a letter she wrote to her son in the war. That's all I have of her and her character 40 or 50 years ago, probably 70 years ago when she wrote that. You see, according to the Stoic philosopher this week and my own anecdotal research, what will be known of me? Not much. Not much. But I want to ask this question today of you. I want you to wrestle with this. What will outlive you? What will outlive you? What will be your legacy? What will be my legacy? You see, when we get to the end of Genesis, the deaths of Jacob and Joseph, we find a similar pattern to both of their last moments. There is this complete deep sense of security, like a planned sign-off as if to say, I've done what I've come here to do, I'm off to enjoy my rest. Sayonara, you know, complete confidence. And here is the words that we read of Jacob's last moment. It says, when Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed, breathed his last and was gathered to his people. That's a great line. Isn't the Bible weird how it gives you weird details? It's like they must mean something. He drew up his feet into the bed. Any married men in the room do that every night? Draw your feet up into the bed. And once you're there, don't talk to me. I'm about to fall asleep. But from the other pillow, there is this whisper. Honey, how was your day? (laughs) There is this moment where this image for me actually is one of comfort. It's connection, right, to its audience. There is a security and a confidence about where Jacob is going. He knows God has done what he was gonna do in and through his life. He's done everything that he's called him to. 
Jacob was confident that he'd seen all that God had for him. He'd blessed his sons. He'd, he'd prayed and prophesied over them. Some of them were a bit of a weird prophecy. But anyway, um, I've taken you all as far as I can take you. And Monica unpacked that blessing really well last week. See, my influence, my work is complete. I'm satisfied. And knowing that he's about to be gathered to his people, he gives these finals and final instructions. I want to be buried in Canaan. What is Canaan? The promised land. I want you to take my bones and I want you to take them back over there because that, that is the land that was promised to our forefathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and to me. It will also be the same with you. The same detail appears at the end of Joseph's burial time. See, Egypt was not their Turanga Waiwai, their place where they stood and found their understanding of who they are. Canaan was that place. They didn't want to be left here. In fact, Papua New Guineans call it Asipes Belong You, okay? If you know what that Asip place, yeah, that's where you sit. We say where you stand. Papua New Guineans love it. Um, but even in his last moments, he knew God's plans. He knew his promises were secure. And so this detail of drawing his feet up into the bed and breathing his last, who wants that said about them? <laughs> I do. Catch you later, guys. Oof, I'm off. With that security and that peace. And so this morning, as we read something of these parts of chapter 50, Together, I want you to absorb something of the, uh, we call it recapitulation, a retelling of the story just right here at the end um, of, of Joseph's story in these verses and his fully formed character, this issuing forth of a legacy that he hopes will carry on in his people after his departure. And so in verses 1 to 14, we, we won't read there, but there's this journey to take Jacob's bones back to Canaan and there's this whole troop following along from Egypt, you know, all Pharaoh's uh, people, you know, probably and dressed in all their garb and horses. And you can imagine this, this caravan of people going back. That is this story. And Pharaoh probably was a bit scared that Joseph was going to go back there and stay there. You know, this is the guy that basically saved an entire nation. Um, so he's saying, you need to come back. So I'm going to send some people with you to bring you back. And then he shares this moment again with his brothers. They've come back, they've buried dad. And we read these words in chapter 15. It reads like this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? <laughs> so Larry say, there's a reminder of legacy being re recaptured here, right? And so when Joseph replies to them, what do you think stirring in his heart? They say these words that they were sent uh, word to Joseph saying, your father let, uh, left these instructions before he died. And this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when this message came to him, Joseph wept. He was reminded of God's formation of his character. There was something within him that today was still going to make the same decisions he made back there, only with more conviction. And when his brothers came to him, there was this, you know what? I am for you guys. And it says this, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. The prophecy from when he was 17, right? You, you will bow before me. <laughs> we are your slaves, they said. And then it says this incredible line. I think this is probably the best in all of his story. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? His character has come full circle. Humility, character fully formed right in this moment. Am I in the place of God? Why, Why would you say that? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what he has now done. In the saving of many lives, he looks back down his story and he can point to all the places which God in his faithful promises has been active. And so then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children, as he's already said. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. 
incredible as a leader to have your brothers still ask that question, but to also reassure them. A few years back, um, a journalist set out to ask some of the world's wealthiest people, what will they do with their enormous wealth when they die? Yeah, There's quite a few sort of um, little surveys done. 90% of those asked, and they're talking to people like Bill Gates, all the way down to people like Jackie Chan, who knew he was worth 400 million. Anyway, uh, and they said, um, all of them said a similar thing. We'll look after our kids, but the majority of our wealth will be put into charitable endeavours like health research and education, serving the poor, etc., etc. But all, without exception, said they wanted their kids to find their own way. Warren Buffett went a step further, saying a person should leave enough for kids to do anything, but not enough to do nothing. Not enough to do nothing. Jackie Chan, he, he said this. He said, if my son's capable, he can make his own money. And if he's not, then he'll just be wasting my money. <laughs> <laughs> my man, Jackie Chan. I can imagine him saying that with that smile on his face. For me, there's a degree of insight here that I would say Joseph and Jacob would agree with and then at a whole other level which they would disagree you see, there is more at stake than wealth and prosperity. There is a willing and intentional sacrifice that's being made that needs to be made for something to live beyond them. You see, there's, there's something to live up to, something to be carried by a generation. There's more at stake. And unlike Warren Buffett or Jackie Chan's responses, Joseph's is a humble and sacrificial one. One that's promise-focused, is confident in what God's going to do. It drove everything that he did. There was a starting place that was different. Unfortunately, I think today, we end up being what we call, uh, what one theologian calls Hezekiah syndrome. Okay, King Hezekiah. Hezekiah syndrome, let me explain to you. When King Hezekiah was nearing the end of his life, the prophet Isaiah, you know, big chunk of the book, uh, Isaiah comes to him and he says these disturbing words from the Lord to Hezekiah. And here's what he says. He says, um, Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off into Babylon, which is the enemy. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. At that point, I would have said, thank you, Isaiah, please leave. <laughs> but he goes on. And some of your descendants, some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, and he's talking about his sons, um, who will be born to you, will be taken away. They will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. They will be castrated so that your line ends and they will become slaves to another king. That's great news. Not. But here's Hezekiah's response. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good. Hezekiah replied, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? He doesn't care about what happens after him. As long as there's peace and security in my lifetime. And as for the other events in Hezekiah's reign, all of his achievements and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which he bought water into the city, they're not written in the book. Uh, sorry, they're written in the book of Annals and the kings of Judah. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors. Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. I wouldn't want to succeed him as king if I had heard that prophecy. I'll be dead and I don't care. Whatever happens after I'm dead, who cares? Some of us, are living that way. That is not the story of Joseph. And I would say it's unbiblical. Let me convince you of Hezekiah syndrome. Essentially, this syndrome is a mindset of Western thought. Yeah? Today we live into this in so many ways. If it doesn't affect me because I'm either dead or I'm not involved, who cares? My achievements are noted. 
Hezekiah basically abdicated his responsibility beyond today as a father and as a king. I'm not going to waste my best years doing that with my life. We live in a time of self-absorption, selfish ambition, where people desire their name to be in lights for their lifetime. And whatever happens outside of that, we just don't care. The environment, who cares? I'm going to die. I'll be in heaven, the end of the earth. Our possessions. Why do you waste so much time gathering possessions only for them to be burnt after you've gone? Or as Jackie Chan would say, wasted by kids who don't care. See, what Joseph is doing is he's creating something different about his legacy, something for the future, not just for his kids, but for future generations. And Joseph's example was even when life serves you hardships, undesirable circumstances, when what others intended for evil, God is in the business of using and bringing about the saving of a nation, of an entire people. It's amazing. See, generational legacies sadly today are buried increasingly, it seems, beneath today's priorities and not tomorrow's. They're buried beneath today's what's here and now and what I can taste and what gets me happy now. The Hezekiah syndrome, the the individualism around us becomes an excuse for the selfishness within us. And we soak it up. I want to tell you, it's unbiblical. It's not the way God intended his people to live. I'm not going to leave my kids anything. I'm going to buy my camper. I'm going to travel the world. I'm, I'm going to make, make myself unavailable when they need me most. I deserve it. I'm going to go and enjoy myself. This is the prevailing understanding within our communities at the moment. Now, I'm not against people taking holidays or going in their camper anywhere. But when that happens at the exclusion of a future for a generation... God shakes his head at that. I believe scripture tells us God would shake his head at that. We have actually been conditioned to believe that because we will be forgotten in three generations, we ought to enjoy what little time we have. I deserve it. And guess what? This is what John Wesley says. What one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. If the next generation is selfish, guess where it started? If the next generation is broken, guess where it started? Your influence is crucial. You see, we need to leave the next generation a heritage, not just an inheritance. A heritage, not just an inheritance. When Queen Elizabeth died, do you remember that? in the halls in in, uh, Westminster Abbey, what happened? Most of the world heard the most Christian sermon you have ever heard. You know, I thought it was amazing. I'm sitting here watching this going, literally the entire world right now is witnessing the heritage of 1,200 years. I can't say if it'll carry on after her with Charles, but... 1,200 years of heritage of being the head of the Church of England coming very much out. She lived her faith. She, she embraced it. And you could tell in that moment. And I was just like blown away listening to this. And I'm sure most of you were feeling the same way. You see, Joseph in his position made the intentional decision to provide for an entire generation and save literally hundreds of lives in the face of continued doubt and even opposition. Based on the promises of God, and based on the evidence of seeing God at work. See, he could have Hezekiah'd it. (laughs) He could have said, you know what? I'm second in charge here. I'm going to live the good life. See you later. (laughs) I don't care about that family, those brothers that did what they did. You know, I'm living my best life now. Stuff them. But what happened was God had been working character into his life that transformed a generation. 
Hundreds of thousands of people lived because he made a decision to be obedient to God and to live into what God had given him the opportunity for. So he wasn't going to allow the surrounding circumstances to interfere with the heritage building that God had placed on his heart. See, a few years back now, a family in my old church decided to partner financially uh, with what would become the Loyal Workshop, uh, a freedom business based in a red light district um, in Kolkata, India. They funded the purchasing of the building, which was absolutely fraught with complications because it's India. It took like five years to actually secure the building. There's people in there squatting, squatter rights in India, all this kind of pff, unbelievable. But they persisted. Uh, they ended up being able to purchase uh, eventually what would house an ethical business offering alternative employment to women that they would never meet. Trapped in a sex trade in India. Their names are not written on any of the walls. In fact, one of their explicit requests was that they would never be known. To never be the ones known to have given that money. I knew them because I was their pastor and I had to do the, the sneaky things around the back for them. Um, their names aren't written on those walls and 18 women who are currently now employed and no longer slaves will never know their name. In fact, in three generations' time, women will continue to find freedom in a far-off South Asian city because God captured a family's heart with his mission and his purpose for human flourishing. And they said, okay, Lord, your promises are good and we are faithful to follow you. They decided to not buy one more rental property. They decided not to buy a holiday home. They decided not to take a few more lavish overseas holidays. They decided to change the legacy and the futures of people that they will never see. You see, the dignity of this next generation of women coming through, their destiny, their legacy was changed because someone was captured by the word of God and transformed by it. They allowed the, the scriptures to shape and, and form their character into something that will be generationally incredible in a city that they will never visit. I think it's incredible what they did. You see, if there's one thing that you can take away with you today, there's one point that you hold in your heart, it's this. It's that our families, our church, desperately need people who will live for the welfare of days they will never see. Desperately need people to be formed by the character of Scripture and live for the welfare of days they will never see. See, Joseph's entire life, formed and shaped as it was, had this goal in mind, living for the welfare of days he will never see. A godly legacy isn't something that accidentally happens. It's not something that will be taught or caught in one hour here on a Sunday or an hour at youth group on a Wednesday. It's something that is faithfully lived into every week, every waking moment, wherever you find yourself. And it's consistently invested upon by a family and a village that pass on the heritage of faith lived among God's people. You are the village to a group of people you don't even know. Your love, your investment, your care connects to all of them, whether you see it or not. Investment when the odds are against you. Investment when you would rather be doing something else with your time. Investment when it's inconvenient or costly. That is scripture. When your one-year-old doesn't want to eat their veggies or your, your teenager throws a tantrum, guess what? God can be right there in the midst of that, helping you to form character for the next generation. Too many people are abdicating the responsibility of parenting in so many ways. That's another whole sermon. 
when you feel like giving up and you're not seeing the results, let's not forego a Christ-like legacy for the sake of our present comfort. See, for those who are listening today who might say, I don't have a legacy to pass on, or I have a legacy I would rather not pass on. Maybe you've come from that background, yeah? I want you to hear that you are more than your past mistakes, your poor attitudes and the ways that you inherited from your family. Today, you can build and begin to build a new heritage into your family, into your family line that will outlive you. I'm living proof of someone's investment. Some of you in here can testify to a number of really key people who said, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm here because a 20-year-old guy grabbed a hold of two 14-year-old guys and said, I want you to know about Jesus. He doesn't know what's going on in my life at the moment, but he invested. He said, God called me to invest and make this time, and he's done it. He doesn't know the results. He just lived faithfully into the welfare of days that he will never see. See, our example in Joseph is a life that shifted out of inherited problems. Yeah, I showed you that diagram right at the start of the series, you know, lies and, you know, uh, marriage failure. And he, he decided to live away from that, creating a new heritage for generations he will never see. And let me say it's never too late to begin creating a legacy. I don't care if you're 15 or 100 in the room. I remember going to um, our 100-year-old when I was in my last church. She made it to 107. I used to go every month and have a cup of tea with her. And she would continue to say to me, I can't wait to meet Jesus. (laughs) I was like, I want to be able to say that at the end of my life. But at 100, she was leading a small group. (laughs) 100 years of walking with Christ didn't give her an excuse to stop investing. How good is that? That's capturing what God is putting in us, right? How will you live for the days that you will not see? I don't know where you've come from, but Jesus and his promises and his word are true. And some of you need to hear that this morning and live into it. I want to close with a, an image. Um, it's a movie that uh, some of you will know. It's one that you can share with the kids. I'm about to wreck the plot line for you, so... You know, you might go home and watch it anyway. We'll see. Um, but it's called Mr. Holland's Opus. Some of you will, will know it. And the reason I want to close with this is it's a great movie, but of a tearjerker, you know. Uh, and it's about a school music teacher, high school music teacher, who resents his job. And he struggles to make sense of his lack of success. He was writing these orchestral pieces and composing, and he thought one day it'll be in all the great music houses of the world. And he spent his life right through to his retirement serving as a teacher in a high school. And he's brought to this final assembly um, and set up just for him after his retirement. And there's an orchestra behind the curtain of all of his former um, students uh, from years gone by, and uh, including a, a governor of state, And she comes out and in a speech that she gives before playing his opus, she shares these words. She says, Mr. Holland had a profound influence on my life, on a lot of lives I know. And yet I get the feeling that he considers a great part of his life misspent. Rumour had it that he's always been working on the symphony of his. And this was going to make him famous, rich, probably both. But Mr. Holland isn't rich. He isn't famous, at least not outside our little town. So it might be easy for him to think of himself as a failure. And he would be wrong. Because I think he's achieved a success far beyond riches and fame. She turns to him and says, look around you, Mr. Holland. There is not a life in this room that you have not touched. And each one of us is a better person because of you. We are your symphony, Mr. Holland. We are the melodies and the notes of your opus. 
and we are the music of your life. If you're a mum at home with little babies at the moment, I know my wife during that time of her life just found it so hard. What is the meaning of life? This is so hard. I'm struggling every single day. Let me tell you, that is not wasted. The gift of a mum being at home with kids, what a blessing. The formation of that young character, the pointing to Jesus, that is one of the most important jobs I think might be resident in this room. From those who can buy buildings for those in India to those who just faithfully do the mahi at home. This is a heritage that you're building into the next generation for those that you will never see. Billy Graham, I'll finish with this quote. He says, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. Character and faith. That sums up Joseph's life. One whose character and faith is formed over time. You see, in three generations' time, if I'm gone, my greatest gift will be how I faithfully lived out my Christian calling in both spiritual and practical ways. I don't care if they don't remember my name, but I care if my great-grandchildren know Jesus. I do. Joseph's story is a calling to lean into the faithful promises of God so that one day we too might draw up our feet and breathe our last, content that those who come after us will live in the welfare and a heritage afforded to them by the generation that they never knew. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we are thankful that you are present to us even in this moment. Lord, would you come and speak? Lord, some of us need to come to you humbly asking for repentance, confessing that maybe we have made life all about Hezekiah syndrome. But Lord, you wanna build in and through us all the way through eternity to the next generation, the welfare of those who will never see it. So this morning, Lord, we ask that you would convict our hearts, move our minds to be practical in our spiritual life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.